Test, 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 test. The biggest omission here is the ability to bind weapons.
All right, guys, we will begin. So let's test out our systems first. The sound check, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 All right. Yes. Yep. Sounds working. Chat seems to be working. Video, video, video. Start, let's try again. Okay, video seems to be working as well. So I am going to mute participants for now. That way, if you guys will need to speak, you can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, probably the quick way of doing that is you can, if, if it's a short statement, you can hold the space bar and that unmutes you temporarily. And when you let go of it, it mutes you right back. But I do see that most of you have video cameras. For now, I'm not requiring that you always have them on, but I do want you to turn them on now so I can kind of get a look and see, you know, what's going on and feel a little better that, you know, it's not just me talking to a monitor and that there's each other. Let's see, I, I'm going through a couple of pages that I have to get a look at the faces that I see. So yeah, see, now you guys can see each other as well. So at some point during the semester, uh, I will require that during lectures, you guys keep a camera on. That way I, I know that you're participating, paying attention, uh, not 
you know, not doing some other things or, you know, that you're even present because I definitely know that a lot of times people turn on their Zoom and then they just go on their, you know, on their own way and do their own thing and they're not listening to whatever is being said nor are they paying attention to the lecture. So for now, if you want, you can turn them back off. I'll keep mine on at least for a bit until I, until I start lecturing. And if you want, you can keep yours on as well. That's up to you. But at some point, I will require that you have a camera because our test taking, when we will be taking our exams, not the first one, but starting from the second exam on, you will be taking them live uh, during lecture time and you will have to have a camera so that I can see what is you know what is going on around you and if need be even here what is going on around you that gives me at least some some sort of uh, feedback as to what you know what is what is it that you have as far as the environment goes during your exams so if you don't have a camera do start thinking about one soon see there's about 47 people logged in that's it's a nice number maybe even more so than you know, we can fit in the class but we'll see what happens all right so Today, let me write down what the plan is. I'm going to share my screen here. The plan is as follows. So the, the main part of this class of the first lecture is this introductory process where I talk a whole lot, probably more so than I talk during any other period of time of the semester. Um, because I, I need you to understand what the class is, how, how it's going to be kind of set up and approached, uh, especially now that it's kind of an online class but not really so the intro is what will take up majority of the day today then i will do a quick lesson just so that we get at least some mathematics in here get going and you'll see how the lessons are going to look how the lectures are going to look majority of the lectures but also i will ask you to do an independent preparation for one four and i'll show you where the video can be found because on a handful number of occasions you will have to uh, watch a video for a specific lesson instead of instead of you know me giving you the lecture it'll be a pre-recorded uh, lecture uh, by by MML. So we will talk about that today and as a sort of I guess practice run we will do we will require that you do one four using that using that approach. So you will have to watch a video on that at your own spare time probably sometime tomorrow. But again usually like 95 percent of the lectures will be not by pre-recorded video but by live you know version of me speaking you can ask questions and I'll be writing stuff on the on the whiteboard uh, that's my pad here my my what is it Microsoft pad or something like that so I have a I have a setup here that it's been working okay and that's what I'm gonna stick to for now after after we do one one so again one four i'm not doing it you will have to do it on your own but towards the end of the day and i might give you a short break sometime you know after the introduction but towards the end of the day i'm going to do a roll call and i really hope that you know you guys are not just going to show up for the roll call and say here and then you missed everything else because then it kind of defeats the purpose and you'll miss a whole lot of important information but after that roll call you'll know if you're on the roster if you're in the class and you'll be able to to go at that point and i will spend probably the last i want to say 30 minutes of class dealing and talking about ad, ads people that are trying to add the class 
So depending on the situation, and many of you emailed me, and I think I, I got back to all of those emails, giving you the link to join the video, that, to join the, the Zoom meeting that you have to participate in in order to even have a chance of being added. It might happen today. It might not happen today. It might happen on Thursday or even next Tuesday. There are many factors that are involved. For example, class should stay at 45 people. And if everybody shows up and we are at like 47, and I don't have room for everybody, then I will have I will not give ads today. I will probably give some permission numbers on Thursday based on based on the waiting list and where you are in the waiting list. And then you know if the waiting list is processed and and there are spaces left, then I'm also going to keep track of who was here today and they'll get priority over somebody who you know who was not here today. So again we will talk a little more about that last 30 minutes with those people that are trying to add and then you can ask some questions about that part but in order to have a chance to add you need to be present during the whole lecture and then we will discuss all the questions with ads in the end of that lecture so let's start with our introduction and I will start by sharing a screen and showing you where you can get the syllabus. You know, and usually in class, I would just pass you the syllabi uh, out, and then we would start going over the syllabus. And I can look at you. I can see you know. I can see you. You can see me here. It's a little bit different. You can still kind of see my face, but I can't really look at the class as a whole. And it is what it is. So. What we're gonna do is share my browser. And if at some point there are some, you know, if there's any technical difficulties, like if my internet, which has been okay for the previous class, if you start hearing me, my voice like a robot or something, like let me know, type in the chat, say something, and maybe I can, you know, pause or fix it or whatnot. So let's go to our LAVC website. So this is our Valley College website, lavc.edu. And that's how it looks. Let's go to the home page. And what we will show you for now is Canvas, Canvas Access. So one way you can access the Canvas website is you go to online classes, click on that. Canvas class login. Click on that. You will then need to put in your credentials, your username, your password, or maybe your student ID and your password, whichever way you log in as a student. Then you will see this page inbox, inbox here. That's the messaging through Canvas. It's not the same as email. So Canvas message and email are two different ways of communicating. And I'll bring that up soon. And you'll see some courses there that you're taking, hopefully. And if you don't see the course that you need, make sure you guys read some of these things. It talks about, you know, if you don't see your course, you go to all courses and stuff like that. You can always contact uh, the help desk, virtual help desk, and they'll help you out with Canvas things. But we will pick our class. We are a 259 class. And let me switch to student view so it looks a lot more like what you should see when you do that. All right, so that's what you will see here, a link for our live lectures that you found one way or another, whether it was through syllabus, through email that you got from me, or Canvas message that you got from me. But there's the link that you would use. You see our week one here, the sections we're going to try and do during week one. We have one, 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 four, which is again something you will do on your own, and then two, one, and two, two for Thursday of this week. And then you see some tabs over here on the left. So where you can find your syllabus is at the syllabus tab. So if you click syllabus, then you can click here and it'll either download or you can open the syllabus so if we, when we go over it it probably is easier if you have it opened on your screen or you can look at the share screen however is easier for you so i'm gonna share i'm gonna share my screen with you and every time i have to share a different screen it's you know it's a process so 
yeah, you'll, you'll get used to it. So now you should see the syllabus, the syllabus here. So it says Los Angeles Valley College, that's us. Math 259, that is the class that you're taking. So it's a pre-calc and a trig combo class. And it's six units. So pre-calc class is a five unit class. A trig class, so let me write some of those things down maybe. So pre-calc. Five units, trig, three units, and five plus three would give you eight units. But this class, 259, is of course not eight units, but six units, which tells you that this is a faster pace class than if you were to take individually a pre-calculus and a trig class as sort of individual two courses. So if it seems like it's a, you know, it's a fairly fast moving class, it, it is because, well, it's a combination class, a combo class. So bear that in mind. Also, what it means to have six units is that we will be seeing each other six hours per week. And when I say seeing each other, I mean like this, you will attend Zoom meetings in total of six hours per week. So we start, you know, right around seven and end right around 10, that's three hours. And we do so twice a week. So this is a two days a week class. We only see each other Tuesday and Thursday. And the starting time is 6.50. So it's not 7 for the starting time. It's 6.50. So please be here at 6.50. And if we finish earlier than 10, then so be it. I will let you go earlier than 10, which will happen sometimes. Other times it will not. So then you will have to, you know, be here, pre be prepared to be here until 10. Now, that's only sort of the face-to-face, -face, the instruction time, the lecture time. On top of that, sort of the, the, the rule of thumb is that you should be spending about double that, so it's 6 times 2 is 12 hours on, or let's say, outside of class. Right, so those six hours is just lecture and exams and, you know, some quizzes maybe during class, whereas the 12 hours that you would, you should expect to put into this class is doing homework, studying, preparing for tests by going over previous lectures, by looking over your homework. So... It's not enough to merely show up and listen and watch the lectures. You do have to put in a substantial amount of work outside of class in order to be successful. So make sure you guys understand that. That's what a six unit class really implies. Now, let's keep going. This is, of course, fall 2020 semester. Section number is here. Again, it's a Tuesday, Thursday class, and here's another link for these Zoom meetings that we will be attending. For now, I'm not putting a password, uh, I guess a password protection on them. If, if something comes up and we'll need to do it, of course, I'll notify you. Your instructor is me, Yuri Sokolovsky, or Mr. S is probably the you know the easier way of addressing me so mr s is perfectly uh, fine or mr sokolovsky or professor s or professor sokolovsky any of those would work and a little bit about me i got my undergrad in 05 i want to say or 06 from UC Berkeley in mathematics. Then I got my master's from Cal State Los Angeles, a little more local, I think in 08 or 09, something like that. And then I started working as a, while I was getting my master's, I was working in Cal State LA teaching, teaching undergrad level, lower level 
courses for about a year. Then I started working in East LA College for Escalante program and also Southwest College as a part-time professor and eventually making my way to Valley College first as a part-time professor and then for about five years now as a full-time professor here in Valley College. So that's the only place I work now. All in all, I've been teaching for, I want to say about 11 years now, right around that time, maybe even a little bit more, and here for about five years. I used to have an office, which we can't really access right now, so the office hours are a bit different than what you actually see here because those used to be like drop-in hours where you could come into my office, see me in person, talk to me in person for obvious reasons that can't happen for now. So my office is fully online and it is not, it is not at any given specific time, right? So those times you can basically ignore them. Uh, those are just times in between the classes that I have. You can write me uh, through Canvas any day, any time of the week, any day of the week, but it doesn't mean that I will respond right away. And Canvas is preferred to email because as I showed you earlier, the website, the Canvas website, you have that inbox a tab there. That's how you can access the Canvas uh, messaging service. <clears throat> and it basically gets to me faster. And I'll explain it a little bit. Emails, I'm getting probably about 100 emails a day right now from, you know, all over the place, from, from different colleges, different places in college. So there's just a ton of email that's going in to my inbox and some of it will be from my students but because there's so much of it I don't always get to it as fast as I'd like to because really my priority is to answer your emails because they could be time sensitive more so than a bunch of other emails I get and if you write me through canvas messages that's only my students that are enrolled in my classes can write me through Canvas messages, and I always check those first, and there's no other, you know, emails in there, any other messages except those from my students, so I can respond to that much quicker, and hopefully that, you know, that's, that's what we would prefer. So I encourage you to contact me through Canvas if you're able to. For those of you that are maybe trying to add the class and you still don't have access to the Canvas messaging, then of course you'd have to email me. I definitely check my messages multiple times a day during the week. Sometimes I try to check them during the weekend, not always, but sometimes I do. And I'll try and respond to you, of course, in a timely manner. And if you really want to speak to me uh, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, a face-to-face -face like this on Zoom, then you would have to, again, message me or email me and we will set up some sort of a time where we can get on Zoom and, and talk to each other if that's really what you would prefer, that I'm open to that as well. But most of the things can be resolved by messaging, by Canvas. I can help you with homework questions by doing like a write-up and, and attaching it as a file. So, so that's probably the best option out there. Okay, my email address is here, so you can use that if you need to, but again, Canvas is preferred. Some description about this class, just a bunch of topics that we will cover. Again, we do cover trig and we do cover pre-calc. So it's, you know, all, all of that stuff. So if you've taken algebra already, which is hopefully something you have done, some of these topics might seem familiar. Uh, functions, equations, uh, series sequence binomials, theorem, inequalities, exponentials, logarithmics, uh, polynomials, rational, so mo and conic sections. Most of those topics are covered in, in algebra class, but then there's definitely some new things like trig, uh, induction, uh, matrices, polar coordinates, that's, that's new. All of those are, are new. So we will go into deeper, you know, understanding of the topics you might already know and of course introduce a bunch of new topics as well.
The textbook that we're going to be using is called Pre-Calculus. It's 11th edition by, by Sullivan. And there's the ISBN number in there. I can kind of show you on camera what it looks like. And then say a few things about that. That So it kind of looks like that, the book. Now, this is a physical copy, of course, of the book. Pretty, pretty thick. But especially lately, and especially so now, I have been saying that you don't really need the physical copy. You will need what's called MML, the platform that we will use for this class, my math lab MML access for your homeworks, for your quizzes, for your exams. But that access will already include the electronic version of this exact same book. So you can access all the same information and more that is found in this book using the e version of it, which you will have access to through MML. So if you really want to have a physical copy, of course, you, I, you know, you, you can get one, not a problem, but I don't think you really need one. That's just my take on it. As far as prerequisites for this class. So we do want you to know your algebra and we do want you to know your geometry. Now, algebra is definitely going to come in more often uh, than, than geometry use. We will have some, you know, some proofs and explanations that will rely a bit on geometry, but nothing too heavy. Whereas algebra, I, I won't be able to, you know, to teach you things that are taught and introduced in algebra and also teach you sort of additions to those things that we would need for pre-calc. I would just run out of time. Uh, so hopefully you guys have your, your algebra skill set still with you. In Valley College, we are calling those classes either a 125 or a 134 class. So that's the prerequisites. And the geometry is a 120, or we also, I think, used to have a 121 for geometry. So those were the geometry classes. Now, a couple of important dates that you guys should keep track of. If you're trying to add this class, it has to be done by the 13th, September 13th. If you're trying to drop this class and you don't want any, any repercussions, any, you know, any leftovers on your transcript, like a W, then it should also be done by the 13th, September. If you drop later, you can still do so up until November 22nd, but then you get a W. You get a W on your transcript. Well, not the end of the world. It doesn't hurt your GPA, but you don't want to have too many W's because it shows, you know, that if you, if you apply for a university that you start a class, but for whatever reason, you don't finish a class. And if you have a bunch of those, they don't always look positively upon that. So there's some important dates. Um, materials that you will need for this class. So again, I do want you to have access to the book in one way or another, whether it be the physical version, if you prefer it, or the electronic version of the book. I want you to have book for your reference because a lot of things are found in your book on top of my lectures there is you know there's a lot of good information in the book that you should use as a resource i do encourage you to have two notebooks one is for your notes one is for your homework neither neither one of those are going to be turned into me they're just for you for you to study so um in, in one notebook, when we do lectures, you'll take notes. In the other notebook, when you guys are doing your homework, that's where you'll write out all that information, all the, you know, the, the steps for getting the answer that you're going to submit online, but you should still write it out. Both of those notebooks, again, I don't collect them. I don't need them. They're for you. They're for you to study, to organize the information that you will definitely need to look over at some point when you're preparing for exams, preparing for quizzes, preparing for final exam. You'll want Want to use that and because we graph in this class you want to have access to graph paper because graphs for min most of the time they'll need to be pretty accurate pretty neat and will require graph paper and pen or pencil I'm okay with that however you take your notes again there for you calculator so I do allow for calculator use I do not want it to be a graphing calculator. I don't want it to be any sort of a computer software or phone application. I want it to be a 
regular calculator that, you know, if you're taking a test at some point, you can show it to me. And if you show me this as your, you know, as your calculator, I'll say, no, you can't use that. That's a graphing calculator. So these are not allowed. It needs to be a basic or a scientific calculator. But I do allow a calculator. Now, before we switch to the next topic, the online homework and MML and talk all about that, I would like to give you guys some time to ask questions on things that you've just heard. So anything you need to clarify or anything you want to ask, please do so now before we continue. Got to be some questions. Uh, as as far as homework goes, um, are the are our homework assignments going to be coming from the textbook? So yes and no, they are from. Um, there's how would I put it? So they're not directly from the textbook. They're from a pool of questions that are similar to what you will see in the textbook, but they're going to be online. So they're not going to be, you know, go to page seven and do number twelve. They're going to be questions posted through this MML uh, platform that we will be using for majority of the things in this class. But you can always find similar questions in your book and then look at examples that explain those questions either in the book or online. So hopefully that, that addresses uh, your question. Uh, so a, a question came in like some of you might be using a two two logins for the zoom and that's fine one is like for a camera and a microphone and the other is for typing so if you have a phone and a computer connected i'm okay with that especially for now so that would be perfectly fine if you do that when we do a roll call at some point then you know if you can say your name or type your name either one will work so for now i'm not too strict on it but do start thinking about about a webcam because you will need it ev eventually i will need to be able to see your environment when you're taking your tests and also sometimes for roll call I, i'll want to see uh, people and see that they're actually paying attention and not just running the zoom meeting and not following what's going on any other questions before we continue so would you be uh, recording any of the Zoom lessons you're giving? No, no. So as for now, the recording of the Zoom uh, lectures is not allowed for various reasons, such as privacy concerns, and we would need to have uh, written permissions from all the people and so on and so forth. And because you guys are students, so we don't, I, I'm not, I'm not, basically allowed to record lectures. I'm not allowed to record video or sound. What I am allowed to do is when I write things on the whiteboard, I can then upload whatever I wrote. That's that's really the only the only thing you will have access to after the lectures. So they you do have to I mean it's 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 an online class, but it's not because if you guys have taken online classes before a lot of them are what's called asynchronous. They're not something that you have to be present at a specific time. You can just watch those recorded videos at your, you know, at your given time. And that was fine for those types of classes. But our classes are synchronous classes, meaning that you have, you have a specific time slot from 6.50 until 10 p.m. where I expect that you were available for that time slot because you signed up for this class. If you're not available for that time slot, you should not take this class. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, twice a week, because a lot, like 90, 99% of the information that will be conveyed to you is going to be through me speaking and writing uh, various things on whiteboard and me saying things just out audio you know and not record it so if you weren't there to listen or hear it and you didn't you know you didn't hear something because you stepped away or because you you couldn't attend that day then you missed maybe a very important piece of information and it's not going to be uh, posted 
on on canvas or anywhere else so you do have to attend lectures all the lectures it is very important so it's a synchronous class where essentially instead of being in the classroom from 6 50 till 10 you have to be in front of the computer and listening to everything that i say from 6 50 till 10 and hopefully taking notes so that's that's that part and the opportunities to work with tutors for sure yeah so there we will have we're still working on a dedicated tutor uh, for this class i am not too sure if they'll find somebody for this time slot because it is pretty late but if they do i'll know next week but we will have our math lab our our tutoring center lab opening starting next week so on tuesday i'll give you guys more um more sort of directions on that or maybe they will even email students directly and give them more directions on that where you will have tutors workshops and you can work individually with tutors or attend workshops that have multiple tu students so there's there's definitely going to be opportunities to work with tutors and hopefully we do have a like a dedicated tutor for our class makes things a little more organized and a little easier as far as i as far as i think but again never we never know we never know if i'm trying but if if not then so be it let's see there's another question so how's the setup going to be on the exams so i'll do like a short a short announcement on the exams and i'll give you a lot more detail on the exams when we get closer to the exam which is i think week four for this class so what will happen for the exams is you will need a camera and you will need to have your camera kind of like my camera is set up, maybe even kind of pointing lower so you can see the table and the workspace that you're using. And you will need to be logged into Zoom and you will need to open your MML. And that's where you'll see the questions for your exams and that's where you will input the answers for your exams. But just like if you were in class, you would be, you know, you would be writing all that stuff. You would be writing all that work on your exam. You wouldn't just write the answers and bring me a paper and say, here are my answers. I would say, well, that's, you get no points for that. Whereas all the work showing how you got those answers. You have to submit the work showing how you got those answers in the regular class and for the exam in this class as well. So you will be writing out neat work on your desk on some papers and when the time is up and when or when you've submitted all of those questions all of those answers you have to turn in the work as well so you will submit the answers through mml and you will scan or use your phone to upload the work showing your work onto canvas so that's more or less how the exams will be but i'll give you more detailed information as we get closer to the exams ideally i mean i would at least you know in the future if you're able to meet in classroom environment i would at least have the exams in person if we're ever able to do that or you know whenever we're able to do that but for now we cannot use facilities we cannot use the campus so everything we do has to be done online but i want to at least have some sort of a surroundings you know and, and see what you have when you're around you when you're taking your exams i don't want to just be you know blind and not know how you're taking your exam i want to be able to see the environment and then to see the work showing your answers all right other questions before we start talking about mml my math lab i have one more question sure uh, go ahead. actually besides the tutoring if we have any questions we can provide you to yes so if you have any questions you can always ask me yeah i mean i'll give you guys sometimes during lecture i'll give you some time maybe in the beginning of lectures in the future to ask a couple of questions or maybe in the end of lectures probably in the end of lectures will work out better or you can write me through canvas and say i am having trouble with such and such question and then i can either do a write-up for you 
or if it's simple enough, I can maybe point you in the right direction by typing some things and saying, you know, this is what you should attempt to do. Or you can also use the resources like the book example and the online on, online um, examples that you will have or tutoring that you will also be able to access. But yeah, you can always ask me questions as well. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Do we have any access to retake an exam or no? No, no. There's, I, and I know that some of our professors have, have Given, been given like makeup exams of some sort. I'm completely not for and never follow that policy. Policy, so there are no makeup exams or you know retake exams. I don't drop exams. You you get just you know when you have an exam, you have just that one opportunity to take it really. And if just in case we are sick and we are not able to physically sit and write an exam, uh, what will happen? Probably doctor's notes and things of that nature would have to be presented to me and maybe then I can figure something out. I mean, there, I understand that there are, there are emergencies that can happen and I am usually very, you know, flexible okay. if, if it's an actual emergency. So, so if, you need to prove that we are not lying. Preferably. I mean, I don't, I don't want to call it that even though i like to call things you know the way that they are but if if it happens once i mean i'm i'm again i'm pretty flexible on things so if something happens talk to me write me and explain the situation but if it becomes some some somewhat of an ongoing issue like if i see somebody oh look for the second exam in the road they can't make it then we're gonna have a you know a different discussion about it but i mean i understand that emergencies happen and sometimes they're you know you can't for whatever reason come in and that's that's understandable just reach out to me and let me know Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Let's see, will there be study guides extra credit? And the second question, will extra credit be available? So that's pretty much the same question, right? So in short, there will be some extra credit available if you guys were in my like 125 class or 134 class at some point um, during your Valley College career as a student, then it I do still keep that uh, that you know that for every exam you guys will get a study guide and the study guide consists of similar questions that you should expect to see on your exam it'll have probably more questions like if your exam is 20 questions a study guide can be 40 or 50 questions and that will be the extra credit so it'll be a small but still extra credit towards towards that exam that the study guide is for. But more importantly, if you really do the study guide diligently, correctly, properly, and understand it, then you'll just do better on the exam. That's that's the main purpose there. But as a sort of a you know carrot on a stick in front of you, it, it I do give extra credit for that. But I don't really give any any other extra credit opportunities. Like I don't give extra credit for attending lectures. That's a requirement or any other sort of, you know, work. So I will address the next question later when we get back to the syllabus about the tests. The extra credit submission, I will discuss that when we get closer to extra credit opportunity to the exam, but it will be, it will be uploaded. It will not be through MML, it will be work written out, uploaded as a document to Canvas in short. All right, so let me go ahead and share my, my syllabus so we can get back to that. And then you guys will have time for more questions later. So here is the syllabus. Online homework. So this is a, I prefer to call it like a web enhanced course, meaning that it is not really an online class because you must be present during these live lectures. You cannot miss them, skip them, and still expect to pass the class because you'll miss a whole lot of information and explanations on how to do things, rules, various, various, various things. So this is online enhanced, meaning that all of your work needs to be submitted online. And our main component for that is 
my math lab or MML platform or software. Now, the way that we will work for homework, the way that things will work for homework is per week, we will try and do about, let's say, four lessons, right? So four lessons per week. For each lesson that we cover, you will have an assignment. So if I, you know, if I cover this week one one and one four today, for example, and then two one and two two on Thursday, then those lectures that were covered, they will each have an assignment posted on MML with the due date being next Tuesday. So whatever we cover this week is due next Tuesday, which will be September 8th. And it's due by the time our class starts. So right around 6.50 p.m. I think I put the due date as 7 p.m. just because it was quicker to do so. So the homework will be posted on MML and that's where you will find it. And it'll be due the following week on Tuesday before class. Now, the way that you enroll and access MML, there's some instructions listed here. You would go to mymathlab.com and I'll do that right now and I'll, sh I'll share my screen. You will need this course ID, which is provided for you. So the course ID is here in your syllabus. So let's take a look at that. Now I have to share a different screen with you, my browser. So if you go to mymathlab.com, you get a screen that looks like that. If you've already used MML, then of course you are familiar with this and you already have an account that you can reuse again the account that is, but you still need to purchase the MML for this book, for this class. If you don't have an account, you would need to go to register as a student. You would click as a student. You need three things. You need to have an email address. That's going to be your, you know, your login. You have to have an email. The instructor given course ID, that's the one that I just highlighted on the syllabus. My last name was some numbers behind it. So that's on your syllabus, the course ID. And since this is a paid platform, you guys will need to purchase it. And the pricing, the pricing is, if I'm not mistaken, $60 if you purchase through them. And the bookstore marks it up, I think $8 markup. So $68 if you purchase through the bookstore. And that will give you access for one semester. Hopefully, you can pass this class in your one semester. That way, you know, you should purchase that access for one semester. But if for whatever reason you're thinking, you know, this time around, I'm just taking it, um, you know, to kind of get a feel for it and I'm not going to try and pass it or how, I don't even know how that logic would go, but you can purchase a more expensive version. I think it's a hundred dollars for the life of the edition of the book. So I, I don't really know when would when it would be ad advantageous to go with that option, but just so that you're aware, the option for the cheaper option for one semester is probably the one that makes the most sense because once you've passed it, you know, you don't really need access to it probably. And you can always, if need be, you can always buy a used physical book or something like that if you ever need to review some things. So I'm not sure if it's worth paying more money to have the access for life of the edition, but you can if you choose to do so. Again, the physical book, you can purchase it as well if you choose to do so. It's probably going to be pretty pricey. You can buy it. Um, you can rent it. You can buy it used nowadays probably. But again, I don't feel that it is something that, that you need the physical book. So I don't think that's something that I am a big proponent of nowadays, especially the pricing, you know, it's super expensive. So that's that. If you purchase through the bookstore, that's also perfectly fine. They sell they sell the, the code for the MML in the bookstore, so you can buy it from them. Or the book, if you choose to, you can buy it from them as well. 
Uh, let's see, Pearson offers the e-text version with my mass lab. Uh, so what does the Monarch bookstore charge? Is that $68? Joseph, over 140. So that's probably the option, which is, which is um, like for the life of the edition. But I think they also have an option for $68, which is just for that semester. And that option comes with the e-text version of the book already. So if you buy it directly through MML, I think it's a little less expensive because the bookstore puts a little bit of a markup on it. So yeah, take a look. There, the, the two options will probably be $60 through um, through Pearson versus 68 through through the bookstore. Or the more expensive, whatever that may be for, you know, for that life of the edition of the book, if you choose to go that direction. But regardless, once you guys have created your account, or if you're still thinking and debating, do I want to take this class, or you know, is this too long and too much, or whatnot, uh, you can do a trial run for 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 MML. So you can do like a trial. I think it's 10 day or 14 day free trial one or the other, I think 14 day free trial. So you can set that up while, you know, you can you can proceed on here and it'll give you an option. Yeah, so somebody's confirming that it's a 14 day trial and you'd just be able to select that as, you know, before you decide to go ahead and purchase it, you can do a trial and then later on purchase it if you decide to stick around basically. But once that's done, you would have your credentials to sign in. So let's go ahead and sign in. You wouldn't have a bunch of classes like that. You'll see your 259. And I see that 12 of you already found a way to this and you were already able to enroll. And some of you already found the temporary access code, right? So that, that means I'm happy, that's good. It's working. I gave you the right information at least. So you would choose the class. 259 is our class. And it opens up your my lab math. My math lab. That sounds better. Well, either way, I call it MML. That's what I'm used to, but I guess it's now my lab math. I don't know why. Uh, but that's that's where you will find most of um, most of your assignments or all of your assignments rather. Your homework, your quizzes, your exams, and your final will all be through MML, in part at least. But first, let's take a look at the e-text, right? So once you pay those $60, you have access to this, which will give you access to your homeworks and to a bunch of other things. One of them is the e-text. So if I click e-text content, I can either select a specific chapter or I can just view the e-text for the course, click e-text here. I guess it opens up a new tab, so it's loading up. Loading, loading, loading. I'm doing this on my backup computer, so it's pretty slow. A little too slow. Let me try it again. And those of you that might have some sort of a software issues, uh, try to use maybe a different browser. So if it doesn't work on whatever browser you're using, maybe a Mac or Internet Explorer, try to use either Chrome browser, Google Chrome, or a Firefox browser, because those are the ones that seem to be a little more compatible. Still having some trouble, but we get it. It has to work. It was working earlier.
oh well maybe it'll load eventually but meanwhile let's explore some of the other versions but what will load eventually is the actual book that you know that you would have the physical if you were to have the physical copy it'll be the same exact book page by page everything is exactly the same so that's why i'm saying you don't really need a physical book um, because i'm not gonna assign homework questions from the book everything is going to be assigned here on mml online so let's go and see how that will look so if we go back to our course home you see here assignments that's where you will find all of your assignments that you'll have to submit so let's click assignments and here we see what has already been open which are the four lessons that i plan to cover this week one one that i'll do today one four that you guys will do on your own preferably tomorrow and then two one and two two that we will do on thursday and let's just pick you know one of them just to see how it looks so if i click one four and notice the due dates right the due dates are listed here all of these four assignments are due september 8 by 7 p.m so by the time the class starts you should already have finished them so let's click on one of them and let's say question nine or something now since it opens a new window i have to share that new window with you guys all right so here we have Question, find the standard form of the equation of the circle having the following properties. We're given the center, center is at negative one nine and it is tangent to the y-axis. So we will of course learn that, we haven't learned that yet. That'll be, or you will have to, I guess, learn it on your own since one four is something you're doing on your own. But you will, you know, write the equation and you'll say, oh, all right, so let's say, you know, maybe it's x equals x equals 9 or something like that. And you're going to check the answer. See, it says check answer. So we click check answer. And it says, nope, that is not correct. Make sure that you're correctly substituting the center, the radius, and it gives you the standard form of the equation of a circle. So it gives you some hints and pointers how to, you know, how to proceed here when it says it's incorrect. Or you can also go on question help and you can view a similar example or you can open the textbook and see that section and, you know, wh what the textbook gives you on that section. Oh, let's, let's try and do that maybe. If maybe it'll open the textbook for me. Will we will we have multiple uh, chances to try these questions, or is it just like one try and then you know you can't do it again? Good, good question. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you that right now. But I guess the book is just not loading for now. So, okay, forget the book for now. But see how, again, let's say you tried something else. You put some other stuff in there. Again, you click check answer. Again, it says it's wrong. You, you're like, all right, let me, you know, let me do it again. So the third time is the final try. Because you see how it says now final check. It doesn't say check answer anymore. It says final check. So whatever you would put in here is the last attempt you get at this specific question with these specific values. So again, you would put something on there. You would click final check. And if it's still wrong, what happens now is it tells you this should have been the answer. So it gives you the correct answer. And then you have an option. You can either say, all right, I spent you know too much time on this question. I don't care if I get it wrong and I don't get full points. Or you can say similar question. And what you see is it's almost the same question, right? It's the same 1.459. So in the book, this would be number 59. So the question setup doesn't change. It's still find the standard form of the equation of the circle having the following properties, but the numbers will change. So previous center was like one, four or four, one or whatever it was. So now it's five, negative three. 
So it's a very similar question, but the numbers are different. Therefore, the final answer will be different. But now you have three more tries to do it. And that you can keep doing and doing and doing. But every time you go for three trials, you have to have a similar question that you would have to do. So theoretically, it's still unlimited, right? Because you can keep doing it and doing it until, until it works out. So hopefully that, that answers your question on that, right? You can go out of order. You can, you know, jump around and do questions and come back and do questions. Some of them are multiple parts. Then you'll have to, you know, if you miss a part and you're okay with it, then you can continue to the next question. If you're not okay with it, you can do again, similar question and try to get all the parts correct and so on. So that's how these would look. The homeworks will look and it'll take time when you're inputting questions. It'll definitely take you a little bit of time to figure out uh, all the shortcuts, all, you know, if you're trying to do shortcuts or using these operations that they give you here and you can, you, you know, you can find a lot more if need be, but usually they give you the ones that you would mostly need here. Like if you need a fraction or if you need an exponent, there's there's different keys for that. So if you haven't used MML, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get used to it and get good at inputting things. So make sure you guys play around with it and get comfortable with it because when we get to exams and we, when we get to quizzes, you will not have those, you know, unlimited, unlimited tries anymore. So for homework, I'm okay with it. That's the point of homework. You try it as, you know, as, as long as you have time for it, as long as it's not due, you try it. Hopefully you learn from your mistakes, but quizzes and exams, you don't get those multiple opportunities anymore. So hopefully during, you know, your practice on the homework, you actually learn the material and on top of that you kind of learn uh, the inputs and how to properly input uh, the answers so that the software reads them correctly and everything else so that's where your homeworks will be that's also where in the future your quizzes will pop up as assignments they'll have not a circle but like some other like a square or something like that just to tell them apart uh, but I'll tell more about the quiz on Tuesday next week because I won't give you a quiz this week. So we'll keep that for now till later. That's where your homeworks are. And then next week, as we do the next lessons, I'll open up more lessons starting next week. And that's just kind of how it's going to go. And then when we have exams, they'll also be here in the assignments section on your MML. So let's see, there is another question in the chat. How many quizzes and exams will we have? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that shortly. I'm going to address that shortly when I get back to the syllabus. First, let me again try the, the e-text, see if it started working now. Or if there's still issues. And I mean, I understand they're probably going through some stuff. Or maybe it's just my computer, actually. I don't know. Were any of you guys able to access the e-text on your computers now? Yep. Or, yeah, so it's then my it's my computer that's that's tripping out somehow. But yeah, so that's you know, that's where you'll see the book. And book is a good resource. It's a good book, and you should definitely use it. It's pretty easy to navigate it through the e-text. So again, physical version, I just don't think it's it's a must at this point. The other part is video and resource library. So for every section that we have, I think I took my pop-up blocker off because it was working like an hour ago. It was working fine. So I don't know what it is. Maybe my computer is tired or something. Who knows? It'll probably work again tomorrow and on Thursday. So I'll just let that go for now. If you were able to open it, it means it's working, so everything is good. But I'll, I'll fix it on my end, no worries. So the video and resource library for every lesson that your book has, and for every lesson, of course, that we will cover, uh, you can choose to go here, the video and resource library, and if, for example, you want to look at chapter one, section four, that you will have to do on your own, you have a bunch of different resources. So we can just select all of them.
Yes, I, so you're saying that it's probably the browser. I agree. I think, yeah, I think Chrome is, um, I think Chrome is probably better than than Firefox for this. I just started this on Firefox. So I'm just going to keep it here. But yeah, Chrome, I think, was a more compatible, better version of this. But anyway, so here you have all of these different visual resources. Some of them are animations, visualizations, uh, videos, PowerPoints, right? Interaction, interactive figures. But the actual video lectures are these guys so this this section section one four that you guys will be responsible on your own you'll be responsible for on your own it has three parts to it graph a circle work with general form work with standard form so three parts to it each one of those videos is part of one four that you'll have to watch so you can access them through here and you can also look at powerpoint and other resources but if i you know if i click a video it'll open up a video that's one way of getting there but another way of getting there is actually going through your canvas so if we go back to our canvas and we'll go to home see here it says week one if it's you know if it's if it's minimized make sure you guys open it up like this by clicking this little guy and here again you'll see that we're doing one 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 four two one and two two and i linked all of those videos directly to canvas so again i don't know if it was worth the, the time doing so but i hopefully made it easier for you guys and instead of going through uh, through mml and looking for them you can just click here and it'll open up those same videos so if i click graph a circle it opens up a video and on you know if i play it you're not going to hear the sound but it has sound it has examples explanations and everything so you can definitely uh, you know definitely look at them even for the lectures that i do you can still look at these as extra material as you know extra resource but again a handful of times i will ask you to kind of do an independent study like for one forum telling you that you should do an independent uh, preparation. I'm not going to lecture on one for you're going to watch this, these videos and learn from them. So you would have to watch all three of these videos. And then if you have questions, you can, you can look at the book, re read the book, or also, of course, you can ask me, but again, it won't happen often. It'll maybe happen on test days and, first day so it's not going to be a common thing but it's still important that you're able to use these resources and be an independent student especially for for later so that's where you can find those videos all right now let's get back to to the syllabus and we're going to discuss the question that was asked earlier about quizzes and exams but before we do that any other questions you guys have about mml about my math lab platform anything that you need me to to address before we continue on well i don't see the uh the class in the canvas in order for me to like access the videos and the MM, MML code, but I'm on the waiting list. Waiting oh, because list. you're on the waiting why? list. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly why. Okay. And I think hopefully that is something that they will fix in the future, because if people are on the waiting list, there's a fairly good chance that they'll be able to, you know, join the class. And it would make sense for them to be able to see the Canvas page already to follow along with the class as it goes. But again, yeah, if you're on the wait list, I don't have a way of, of giving you, you know, the Canvas. You can still join the MML, though, with the syllabus. Uh, and if you don't have access to the syllabus, then email me. So for those of you guys that are that are going to kind of hang around and and try to join the class, uh, you can email me and ask for the syllabus and I'll attach it. And that way you have, you can, you can, you know, you have the course ID and you can at least follow through MML, not Canvas yet, but MML. But I'm hoping that I'll be able to, to do all the ads by Thursday. I'm hoping. So hopefully it won't be too long. All right. Okay. Thank you. 
Yep. Any other questions on MML? It'll take some practice and make sure you guys start early. Don't put this off. Get used to it. Don't fall behind. All right. Quizzes and exams. So there will be quizzes through MML. As far as quizzes, I do drop the lowest grade from your quiz, from all of your quizzes in the end of the semester, assuming, assuming that you are participating in class. Like if you're not showing up for a bunch of lectures, not doing your homework, then I don't need to take my time to drop any of your lowest quizzes because you're probably just going to fail the class anyway. So dropping the lowest quiz score is not going to change much. So that's why I'm putting that in there. I don't do makeup quizzes. So if for whatever reason there was a quiz and for somehow you didn't know there was a quiz or for whatever reason you couldn't take that quiz, then that's on you. And, and yeah, you can still reach out to me and ask, but unless there's a really valid excuse, there is no makeup quizzes. And what quizzes do is they test your knowledge of the homework. So if I give you a quiz, it will always be on what was already due for your homework. For example, next week, I can give you a quiz on these four lessons uh, that we're going to do this week. And that's how it works. So I will never quiz you on the same week material. So it's always on whatever was already due. Now, how many quizzes? When it's a regular class, meaning that before we hit this pandemic situation, it was a regular face-to-face -face class, I usually try to get about 10 quizzes. Sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's nine, sometimes it's 10, but my, my number is 10. That's what I try to reach because this is the first time I'm doing a full semester in this situation, I don't know, but I'm going to still try for 10. So essentially what I try and do is I try to give you a quiz or an exam every week. So if there's already an exam, I'm not going to give you a quiz that week. If there is no exam, I'm going to try and give you a quiz that week. And that gives us right about 10 quizzes. So that's, that's the goal. If I have slightly less, I'm okay with that, but right about 10. Exams, there will be four exams, and the exams are more strict. I'm not going to say, oh, maybe I'll give you two exams or five exams or three exams. It'll be four exams, and they're already scheduled, so you have the days, the dates, when those exams are, and they're marked on the calendar, which is the last page of the syllabus that we will get to soon. And also there's no makeup exams. And notice that I say nothing about dropping the lowest exam because I do not do that. I keep all four of your exams. So no exams are dropped and no makeup exams will be given. A couple of questions here. Will we take quiz during the class or after? Quizzes are most likely going to be after class. Meaning, let me rephrase that. Quizzes are most likely not going to be during class time. I will probably give you guys a pretty large window, like a 24 hour window during which you can take uh, the quiz. Not, I, I haven't decided exactly when. It might be on Wednesdays. It might be on Mondays, but it'll be like a 20 or even Sundays or something like that. But it'll be a 24 hour window. So hopefully people can find, you know, an hour during a 24 hour period or even less, probably 30 minutes or 40 minutes during that window to take the quizzes. The exams will be different. We already mentioned it briefly. We'll mention more detail for the exams as we get closer to the exam. But for quizzes, I have not decided on a day yet, but it will not be during lecture time. So it'll, it'll, be, um, it'll be sort of asynchronous, right? So you'll have a window, a 24 hour window, and I'll let you know ahead of time. So it might vary, but I'll try to eventually try to kind of keep it constant once I get a feel for what works out the best for most students. 
and then we will we will go with that and i might even give you like a poll on thursday and ask you which day would you prefer you know for quizzes so i'll i'll maybe do that even as far as how many questions all right well, that's a decent question i guess i can generalize it so for quizzes quizzes are shorter quizzes are going to be probably time wise about 30 40 minutes and probably involve three to five questions uh, they will cover usually a few sections like three four sections from previous week that's for quizzes the exams are longer they cover a few chapters and you'll probably get about hour and a half to two hours for your exams and there'll be probably about 15 to 20 questions for the exams so three to five for quizzes about 15 to 20 for the exams will there be a countdown when we, yeah so so during that 24 hour window for the quiz once you started there will be a timer so once you started, you cannot say, oh, let me finish it in a few hours. You know, let me put it on pause or something. Once you started, there's a timer and whatever that timer is going to be, 30, 40, 45 minutes, it, it'll start counting down. Yeah. Any questions on quizzes exams? I guess on exams, there's probably still a lot of questions, but I'll give you more information on exams later as we get closer to the exam. So let's continue on. Final, final exam. That is a big one. Final exam is cumulative, meaning that it includes everything. It can include everything that we covered during the mm -hmm. semester. The thing is, the exam's cumulative. Is that a question or? or what does that mean? that it's going to be about it because you're breaking off if it's a question then 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 repeat yourself if it was yes yeah, so i guess you you forgot to mute yourself yeah thank you so final exam comprehensive cumulative however you want to call it so everything is fair game basically chapter one through chapter 12 whatever we cover in class I can ask you on the final. The date is set in stone. It is Tuesday, December 15th. And believe it or not, it's going to come pretty quickly. It's four months away from now. So you have time to make assignment. arrangements, figure out your vacation plans and all the good stuff. But on that day, you have a final. And that day is not flexible and the time is not flexible. I have not given many sort of you know make up finals that just doesn't happen it's really difficult for that to happen so yeah just make sure you mark your calendars make sure you guys are aware seven till nine is your final on december 15th the grading for this class so it's percentage based meaning that it doesn't really matter how many points a quiz is or how many points an exam is what matters is how many of those points you received. So whether you receive seven out of 10 points or 700 out of a thousand points is the same 70%. So it's a percent based. And there's not going to be multiple attempts on the exams. Definitely not. So the exams, you guys get one attempt and that's it quizzes i might start out with a couple of attempts for quizzes until we kind of get used to the software and everything else but exams is one attempt so again it's percentage based meaning that whether you got seven out of ten or seven out of a hundred or you know whatever else calculate your percent for each assignment and the weight for the types of assignments is also, of course, different. So homeworks are going to be weighted as 10% towards your overall grade. Quizzes are 20% towards your overall grade. Exams are 40%. So each exam is basically 10% of your grade. Together, there's four exams, 40%. That final, that one final exam is 30%. It's a big one. It's like the gatekeeper tells me, are you ready to move on and attempt calculus classes? 
because if you completely you know fail your final exam it's really going to show on your overall grade you can really you know 30 percent is a big chunk of a grade so the weight of the final is pretty heavy as far as the overall letter grades standard system i'm using no curves no weird boundaries it's 90 to 100 for a 80 89 a b 70 79 is a c 60 to 69 is a d which is not a passing grade d is not a passing grade anything below 59 percent is a fail so that is the breakdown for the letter grades a couple of policies to go over being late if i take a roll call whenever during the class i can i can bust out a roll call all of a sudden it could be in the first five minutes of a class it could be in the middle of a class it could be in the last five minutes of the class whenever i can even do it multiple times if during the roll call you are not responsive you might be in a chat or you know present as far as you're logged in but you don't say here nor do you type in the chat here when i call your name then you will be marked late even if you you know within a few minutes within you know some if it's right away then that's fine like you know if it's within a few seconds i'm, I'm not gonna count it against you but if if you know after 10 minutes all of a sudden you're like oh i'm here you will be marked late three lates equates to being absent if you are absent three times so it's six hours but for us i guess it translates to three times if you're absent uh, then i can drop you from the class so what that means essentially is if you are logged into zoom and then i did a roll call but you never you know you never responded even though i'll see your name there but i'd be like you know miss lopez and and it's quiet right and then the class is over and you're still there in the chat i'll close the zoom window and even though you were there in the chat i will not mark you present or late i will mark you absent because well i don't know what happened maybe you logged in the first you know three minutes and then went on to you know to watch some some movies or whatnot so you do have to be responsive eventually i might actually say you have to you know towards after we have our first exam i might say you have to keep your camera on during the whole lecture i might do that that way i really know what you're doing what everybody's doing during the lecture and whether they're you know paying attention or not for now i'm not doing it but we'll see so once you're absent total of six cumulative hours which for us is three times i can drop you i don't like to drop people because they're absent but if i see that you know you missed an exam or you missed a bunch of assignments quizzes and then you're absent three times then i feel like you you're just not taking the class seriously it's not your priority so why waste your time why waste my time then i might drop people i i don't like to do so if you're absent and there is a legitimate excuse and a reason reach out to me and i might count it as an excused absence let's see how would you suggest we prepare for quizzes exams so for quizzes homework for quizzes definitely do homework that's the preparation for quizzes for exams also do homework well homework you should do in general but for exams also do those study guides i and feedback from my students and i i as a student myself i mean i was a student for many 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 years feel that on top of homework if you have a study guide professors kind of telling you this is what you should concentrate on so it's important to kind of also concentrate on that so for exams definitely study guides will be important so homework and study guide i think is sufficient if you if to get an a in this class yeah i don't think you need to you know but again, everybody's different. Every every situation is different. Some people you might need extra help and you might need to go to tutoring or read outside resources. Some people don't even need to do a study guide. Some people don't even need to do homework. Some people can just kind of, you know, oh, I understand this. You know, So it, it's, it really is individual. But homework and study guides, I think it's good. I think that's a good start, sufficient. All right. As far as student conduct, um, 
just be mindful, right? When we started the class, you guys saw that there's like 45 of us or however many there were all hopefully sitting in front of a computer with their headphones or with their speakers and hearing everything that everyone says, right? So if, if you have a background noise, mute yourself because it's, it's only fair to everybody else and me that we don't hear you unless you're asking a question that relates to the discussion. If you know, if you have some loud music going on, we don't want to hear it. It's distract distracting. At some point we will have video. At some point we will be required to have video. Be mindful of your surroundings. You know, you might have put on a shirt and decided that they're only going to see my, top half and forgot or decided not to put on some pants right and then maybe you forgot that you're on video and you start walking around or whatnot so just be mindful that again there's 45 of us or however many and you know we can see and hear each other so try to try to remember that and also a dress code i mean whatever we see should be properly dressed, right? So if I'm only going to see your top half, be properly dressed. I don't want to see, you know, I don't want to see you lounging on the, on the beach chair and, you know, zoom, zooming or however you would call it as you're tending or whatnot without a shirt. So be properly dressed, I guess. And yeah, that's, that's the conduct. Even though I haven't added that onto my syllabus, I'll probably do it at some point. So be mindful. As far as cheating, so plagiarism, academic dishonesty. Once we switched online, it's easier to cheat. I mean, there's new ways to cheat. Some of them are pretty cool. When, you know, when we discovered them, there were some cool things, technologically advanced things, but it's still cheating. So if it's not you who's doing the work, if it's, you know, if, if you're cheating while you're doing the work, if you're getting help from notes, books, right, or other people, it's all considered cheating. Your quizzes, your exams are closed notes. Should not be, you should not be using any outside resources. You should not be getting any help. But it, a lot of it is sort of on their system because I can't catch everything. So I'm, I'm encouraging you not to cheat. And I'm telling you that if I catch you cheating on one assignment, I'm definitely going to assume that it has happened before. And I'm definitely going to report you uh, to the powers above that kind of deal with those situations which are, I guess, VP of Student Services or Dean of Student Services, whatever is their proper title. And she is no fun to deal with. I can promise you that. You don't want to deal with her. And if you're dealing with her, that's that's not good already for you. So if, if it's not your first offense, then it can go as far as you'll be you'll be dropped from the class, from the college, from the district. They, you know, they can do a lot of things. So it's just not worth it. You know, don't cheat. You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because if you cheat through pre-calc and then you get to calculus and you're not ready for calculus, are you going to, you know, you can't, you can only get so far. So I'm really, really discouraging that. But I do understand and you do understand that it's still honors, honors system. So I can't see every move and everything that you do. So hopefully, yeah. Tutoring lab, next week I'll talk more about it. Obviously, it's not in LARC 226 anymore. Can't physically go there, but when they give us more information, I'll let you guys know. Religious holidays. If there is a holiday that you're, that you're going to observe, you know ahead of time. Let me know ahead of time. Do not... Uh, you know, if it's if it's an exam, if there happens to be an exam on that day that you're observing a holiday on, let me know at least a week in advance and we'll try to fix and figure something out. If you let me know on the day or after the fact, and you'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't take that exam, but you have to accommodate me because it's a religious excuse, religious holiday. I'm going to say, uh, no, I don't, because you were supposed to give me a week's notice. And if you didn't, then 
that's on you. So make sure you guys give me a week's notice and then we can try and sort something out and figure something out. Um, SSD office, again, I, I honestly don't know if they have anybody staffing the physical office or if it's all online. I'm somehow assuming it's all online. So make sure you guys either call them, telecommute, right, or call or email if you have any questions about SSD or financial aid, make sure you reach out to them. Read some of the Title IX compliances, some disclaimers in there. The main one is everything is subject to change. It will be nearly impossible for us to stick to the plan, right? There will be some things that will have to be shifted around and moved, but we do have a plan. There's our plan. 15 weeks. Is that right? I thought it was, hopefully this is right. <laughs> yeah, I think it's okay. So our exam will be 15th. That's here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Man, I guess I think it looks right. Well, anyway, so this is our plan, the master plan, which we will try and follow. But you see that, you know, some days I have two lessons, some days I have exam and two lessons. So it won't, it, some days you have three lessons, so it won't work out exactly as is, but at least it gives you an idea. It gives you sort of this idea of what I'm trying to get done and when. But this is fluid, except the exam dates. These are, these are staying. So your first exam will be the 22nd of September, second exam, 20th of October, then 17th of November. Then you see that there's not a whole lot in between time, third and fourth exam, fourth exam, first of December. And then you see that again, there's not a whole lot of time between the last exam and the final, but that's just the way that I have it set up. So that is the calendar we will try to follow. And also you will be able to follow on Canvas. As I open week by week, you'll see the sections that we cover and that will be a little more sort of, res um, not responsive, but sort of more uh, up to date. Because if I either go a little faster or go a little slower, I can't really change the syllabus, but I can shift stuff around on your Canvas page to reflect that. So this is the plan and this is your syllabus. Make sure you guys again read over it at some point on your own. A lot of this information is pretty important. Any further questions that you guys now have? Anything you want to clear want me to clarify now? Like right now, it would be good for me to see what's going on, which are you guys all like asleep? Or are you still paying attention? Who knows? I only see like a couple of people. So yeah, let's do that. Turn your turn your cameras on. Like make me feel a little better that again, there are people there. So did you say that a scientific calculator is okay? Scientific is good. Yes, yeah, scientific okay. calculator is okay. Oh, look at that, look at that, cameras are popping up, I see people, that's cool. And I have two pages of people, so we still have quite a few of you, 45, I guess, participants right now. All right, thank you, I do feel a little better, people are still there. All right. So no, no questions that came up, nothing that came up yet, then I guess we can continue on with our plan, which is to do a quick lesson. So we're going to do one one at this point. It's again, it's a short lesson and one four you guys will do on your own. So now you'll at least get to see kind of how I plan to run the lessons. And then if you maybe will have questions on that, you will be able to ask them. So here's the whiteboard that I'm sharing. That's where all the written stuff happens. At the end of the day, I save all of the written stuff that goes onto the whiteboard and 
I upload it to your canvas. So you'll be able to review whatever I write here. Again, I don't record any video or audio, just whatever I write here. So let's start with one one. And when I do a lecture, I, you know, I prefer to actually turn my video off. I don't know why, but that's just how I do it. So I'm going to stop the video for myself and then you can concentrate on what I write. And of course you can still hear me, so that's good. All right, so for one, one, we're going to talk about distance and midpoint formulas. Distance and midpoint formulas. And the first one that we will start working with is the distance formula. And for the distance formula, instead of just giving you the formula, I prefer to kind of discuss a little bit where it comes from. And we start that process by talking about one dimensional, one dimensional space. So in one dimensional space, 1D for one dimension, that means we only have movement in, in sort of on the line. Movement on the line is one dimensional. So I can only move on this line. However I draw it, that doesn't matter. I can draw it vertically, horizontally, or even, you know, at a slope. But one dimensional means I can only move about this line. I cannot go away from this line up here, down here, because that would then mean two dimensional. So one dimensional is I'm on this line. And for reference purposes, we will put zero and then positive numbers to the right. And our scale will be integers by one, negative numbers to the left. So this is what we know as a number line, which you're introduced to in algebra for sure. So if I want to find the distance between two points on the number line, let's say negative three and positive two. These are my two points on this number line. I know that the distance between them would be five units because I can just count it, right? I can say, oh, look, one unit, two units, three units, four units, five units. So the distance between these guys is five units. But I also know that there's a more systematic, more general way of finding the distance between two points in one dimensional space. If I use this example, I can either do negative three, the first point, minus positive two, the second point, that would give me negative five, but I know that distance is always positive. And a function that we have in math that guarantees a positive outcome is the absolute value. So if I put these in absolute value, then that will give me the distance between these two points. Absolute value of negative five, five, five units. I also notice that it doesn't matter which point I choose as the first point and which point I choose as the second point. I could have also done two minus negative three in absolute value. And that would give me absolute value of five, which is still five, right? So that we can then generalize and say, well, this is the formula, the distance formula in one dimensional space. If I have two points and I call one of them x sub one and the other I call x sub two, right? It, does, it doesn't have to be negative three and two. It could be any positive or negative, it wouldn't matter. Then I can generalize the formula in one dimensional space to be the difference between those two points between those two values. So this is the distance in one dimensional space. But that's not very interesting. We are more interested in two dimensional space. 
eventually in three-dimensional and n-dimensional space because you can expand this but it comes from understanding this part so in two-dimensional space Well, two-dimensional means that you are not stuck on a line anymore. You can go away from the line. You're still limited. It's not three-dimensional space, right? So you can't really go out from a plane, but two-dimensional space means you have a plane. So you have your horizontal movement and you have your vertical movement. And this gives us a set of axes that we refer to as a rectangular plane or Cartesian plane that also we cover in algebra. And it gives us the opportunity to discuss now two-dimensional sp space because now I can have a point anywhere, right? And that point is defined by the X component. So let's call this X sub one and the y component, let's call it y sub 1, and we call this point by its ordered pair. It's no longer one number that defines the point, it is now an ordered pair that defines the point. And it's always x coordinate first, y coordinate second. So x sub 1 comma y sub 1 defines a point in this coordinate plane. Now what we're interested in is device the deriving or, or you know understanding a formula that finds the distance between two points regardless of where they are in this coordinate plane and first we'll do an example with numbers and then we will say well let's consider you know a general example and a general formula and make sense of it so let's first do it with just numbers specific numbers let's say i have my coordinate plane. Usually when I do graphing, I'll have a different software running where I actually have a grid like graph paper, but here because there's not a whole lot of graphing, I'm just kind of doing it like that. That that software is a little bit nicer, but it's a little more time consuming to set up and save. All right, so let's say I have an ordered pair up here let's call it two, four. So I have my point, which is represented by ordered pair two, four. So again, what that means is my X component is two, my Y component is four. Now let's say I have another point, and we'll call it negative one, negative three, for example. Just some random two points Oh, I said something, I wrote something completely different. Negative one, negative three. So just some random two points. And what we want to do is find the distance between these two points. Let me try and do it like this. So we want to find the distance between these two points. Now, because we already know how to work with one dimensional space, that's something that we discussed here on the first page. And we know the formula for one dimensional space, we're going to break down this problem into two components. We're going to say, let's create a triangle. And for that triangle, we're going to go down from one point, and in this case, go to the right, at least that's one way of doing so to the other point, and we will have a third point now, a third point here. But what's special about this triangle is this is a right triangle, a 90 degree triangle. And what I did is I have now created two components for this problem. Lines, so let me try it again. One of them, I'll call it D sub 
y, let's say, I'll call it d sub y, is the distance between these two points. Now let's write down what is the coordinate of this point. We can pretty easily tell that the x coordinate of this point is the same as the x coordinate of the point above it, so it would be still 2. And the y coordinate of this point would be the y coordinate of the point to the left of it. It's on the same vertical level, so it would be negative 3. We can pretty clearly see that from the picture. So the distance, which I'm calling d sub y, is simply the change in the y coordinates of these two points. One of them is 4, one of them is negative 3. But we already know how to find the distance of two points that are on the same line, whether it's vertical or horizontal, doesn't matter. The distance between the two points on the same line is the difference. So I can do either 4 minus negative 3 or negative 3 minus 4, same thing. So I'll do 4 minus negative 3 in this case, which will give me absolute value of 7, which is 7. So the distance between these two points is 7 units. Now similarly, I can find the distance between these two points, I'll call it d sub x. These two points are again on the same horizontal line now. So it's a matter of just finding the difference between their horizontal components, between their x components. So it's negative 1 for one of them, positive 2 for the other. And I, again, I can go in either order. I'll do negative 1 minus 2. I have to find their difference negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Absolute value of negative 3 is 3. So I know that the distance between these two points or the length of this side of the triangle is 3 units. So what I've now created is a geometry problem. I'm telling you that you have a right triangle. Again, it should be a little more triangle looking. So I'm telling you have a right triangle. If you're interested, remember what we're after is this guy, the distance between those two points. So let's call it D. But we've, we already know the distance or the length of this side, one of the legs, and we know the distance or the length of this side, the other leg. And what this is, is a Pythagorean theorem problem, right? And do you guys remember your Pythagorean theorem from geometry? What does the Pythagorean theorem tells me, tell me about this triangle? A squared plus B squared equals C squared? Yeah, so in general, if we have you know, A and B are the legs of a right triangle, C is the hypotenuse of that right triangle, then the sum of the squares of the two legs always equals the square of the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always the longest side opposite of the right angle. So in this case, D is my hypotenuse. And I'm going to say D square equals the sum of the squares of the two legs, and my legs are 3 and 7 in this case. 3 squared plus 7 squared. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find my d eventually. 3 squared is 9. 7 squared is 49. So I know that hypotenuse squared is going to give me 58. So if something squared is 58, then that something is the square root of 58. Can we, can we simplify that though? Because remember, you guys are dealing and submitting your work um, through a computer. And if you don't simplify your fractions, if you don't simplify your radicals, 
it will most likely say that, you know, you don't get the points for that work. Even though everything you did up until that point is correct, it might be the algebra that messes it up. So in this case, 58, uh, let's see, I don't think that's, that's going to be uh, divisible by any perfect squares. What about the seminal number that we can round up and write as a... Well, if so, that'll depend on the directions for the homework question. If it'll say we want exact value, then you would leave it as the square root of, you know, of 58. Or if it can be simplified, you would simplify it as still a radical. But some questions will also ask you to approximate. So if it'll also say approximate, let's say, you know, to two decimal places, then you would use your calculator and you would plug in square root of 58 in your calculator. So you, you might need a calculator. And if it's two decimal places, you would say 7.62, I guess, when we plug it in the calculator. So make sure you guys are careful with the directions on your online homework. The exact answer and approximation. If it asks for both, then you got to do both. Okay, on that. Yay, nay. Yay? Yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. Seems good. So again, a little bit of, of geometry you might have to remember, right? But not not too much of geometry here. It's Pythagorean theorem, which we usually cover in algebra as well. So question. yeah, go ahead. So to clarify. If it doesn't say anything about approximating or exact value, you simplify it? Well, if it doesn't say anything, then it's going to be exact. Okay. But what I meant by simplify is let's say that our numbers were a little bit different and you got something like square root of, you know, square root of, I don't know, 80 or something, right? then you don't want to leave your final answer as square root of 80 because you can simplify the radical. And that's where your algebra comes in. You can say, oh, I know that, that I can factor 80 as a perfect square times a factor, right? So 16 times 5 would be the ideal choice here. The largest perfect square factor. So 4 would come out and the 5 would stay, right? So if, if, if we can simplify the radical, you should simplify it. But okay. that's still an exact answer because it still has, you know, it's still, it's, it's a radical, it's an irrational number, right? So that's what I meant by that. But again, in the directions, I think that for some of the questions, it'll say, find the exact answer and approximate to two decimal places. Then you would have to use a calculator, punch it in and do both, right? So it'd be at like a two-part question. Okay, thank you. So now once we have this, we can go ahead and say, well, what happens in the general case? What if it's just some two points that I have in two dimensional space and one of those points is X sub one, Y sub one, and the other point, again, it doesn't matter which quadrants they fall into. The other point is X sub two, Y sub two. How can I find the distance between these two points? How can I find the length of that segment, right? That's the distance between those two points. And it will be very similar logic that we just did in the previous example. And we would say, well, we can make a triangle. We can make a triangle, which will turn out to be a right triangle. Actually, let me do a different color. we can still make this triangle and this will be a right triangle. And now this distance, this vertical distance is the absolute value of the difference y sub two minus y sub one. This horizontal length, call it d sub x, we can find that distance by doing 
by looking at the vertical at the horizontal change x sub 2 minus x sub 1 in absolute value and then we can set this up and say let's call what we're after d that's the hypotenuse so then we have d square should equal to x sub 2 minus x sub 1 but then squared plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared, right? However, we know that when we square a number, an integer, or not an integer, a real number, when we square a real number, the result will always be positive. So the absolute value is redundant at this point, because I know that whatever is the result, when I square it, it'll still be positive. Whether I get 5 or negative 5, when I square it, it'll be positive 25. So the absolute value is unnecessary because I'm now squaring. So I can drop the absolute value. And then I'm after d, not d square. So I would then have to square root both sides, and that will give me the following formula, that the distance between two points is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And that is exactly the distance formula in two-dimensional space. So that's kind of how we make sense of it. But now let's write it down in a more... Um, more proper way, I guess, on the next page. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds, rather, to catch Quick up. question, Professor. Mm -hmm. Does it matter if you do x1 minus x2, or does it have to be x2 minus x1? It, it does not matter, because nothing prevents me from saying, what if this is x2 and this is y2, and this is x1 and this is y1, right? It's arbitrary it. two points, so it absolutely doesn't matter. Uh, which one you do Got it. as your first point and as your second point, what does matter is you have to be consistent. So the question is if a line is vertical. So if a line is vertical or horizontal, then you're right back to the one dimensional space and you don't have to use, you could still use it, but you don't have to use it, right? Because one of your components is just going to be zero and it's going to play itself out to be the same as the one-dimensional uh, formula. Because if you're on vertical or horizontal, you're in one-dimensional space now. So let's generalize this and say the distance between two points x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2, is given by, now maybe I should rephrase what I just said earlier. So you could use the one dimensional approach if they're on the same line, vertical or horizontal, but you could still use this distance formula. It'll still work out just fine. What will happen is that one of your differences that you're going to look at since they're on the same vertical or horizontal line is just going to be zero, but everything is you know, still going to work out fine and it, the formula will still work. So nothing, you know, nothing needs to change. You just plug in the points the same way. So the distance between these two points is given by the following formula that we just looked at. D equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And that's the distance formula. So you'll have a couple of easier questions and a couple of more interesting questions for your homework that I'll want you to try. We're going to do the midpoint formula really quickly as well 
for the midpoint formula, we're just going to kind of write it down and not do too much of geometrical derivations of it. So the midpoint formula. In general, when we talk about the midpoint, we're talking, about, again, this is in two dimensional space. We're talking about having two points in a coordinate plane, some arbitrary two points. And the midpoint is the point which divides this segment into two equal parts. So this here is what we refer to as the midpoint between two points, the midpoint of this segment. And the coordinates of this midpoint are given in the, using the following formula. So if I call this midpoint M, then the coordinates of this point M are going to be dependent entirely on the two points here. So if this is again x sub 1, y sub 1, and this is x sub 2, y sub 2, then the x coordinate of the midpoint is going to be the sum of the x coordinates divided by 2. And the midpoint y coordinate will be the sum of the y coordinates divided by 2. Because again, we're discussing a point here. We're not discussing a length or anything like that. We're talking about an ordered pair, which has x and y components. And that's the formula that would give us the x and the y components. So let's go ahead and do a quick example on that. Something like number 42 from your book. So it says find the midpoint. And it gives you the two points. So find the midpoint between the given two points. P sub 1 has the coordinates of 2, negative 3. P sub 2 has the coordinates of 4, 2. And our goal is, again, just to find the midpoint. So we would use our formula and we would say the x coordinate of the midpoint is the sum of the x coordinates divided by 2. The y coordinate is the sum of the y coordinates divided by 2. Then, of course, you would want to simplify 2 plus 4 divided by 2. That's 6 over 2. That is 3. Negative 3 plus 2 divided by 2, that is negative 1 over 2. So in general, we want to use fractions. I am pretty sure that for the homework, if you would have input a decimal, it wouldn't accept it. I'm not too sure, but I'm pretty sure. It'll probably say that, you know, we need to have the number given in a simplified fraction form. So in general, we use fractions. We only use decimals when the question will ask us to, to approximate the answer. Because fractions, most of the time, you know, can be used to express exact values, most of the time, for rational numbers. Um, whereas decimals are rarely exact unless it's a very sort of specific case. So fractions, not decimals. All right, so again, that was our first lesson. Now you guys kind of see how it's going to look when I lecture on things. I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to write things down, write some explanations, derivations, formulas, and then I'm going to take these, you know, all these pages and save them and upload them onto Canvas for you. Again, I'm reminding you that I'm not going to lecture on 1-4 uh, because first day is pretty, you know, pretty, pretty tiresome for everybody. But I still want you to do 1-4 on your own.
I want you to watch the videos related to 1.4 through MML, which are also linked to your canvas. So however you can access those. And there is a homework for 1.4. All right, so what we're going to do now, I guess I'm not gonna give you a break today because I'd rather just let you go a little earlier than giving you a break. So let me save these and then I'll upload them onto Canvas later. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a roll call. So I want to go over the names of the people um, that are uh, that are enrolled and then I'll be able to let you go those that are enrolled uh, well don't say here yet I have to first call your name but first let me see can you go over when to leave a value as an absolute versus to simplify to leave it as a decimal or a fraction so absolute value should always be simplified if you have absolute value, you should always apply it. You never leave your answer as absolute value of, you know, negative seven or positive seven. You should always apply the absolute value. That's one. Fractions are always the, the way. Rarely will you use decimal. The only time you use decimal is if a question asks you to approximate. So if the question says approximate, to the nearest tenth or approximate to nearest hundreds, that's when you will have to use the decimal representation for approximation. Other than that, fractions. So hopefully that clears it up, but as we go and we have more concrete examples, you guys will be able to kind of see that. All right, so let me prepare for the roll call. I have to pull up a couple of things here. Again, for now, since I haven't required a camera, I am not going to require that you turn the camera on for the roll call for now. Eventually I will. Uh, you can respond, when I call your name, you can either respond in the microphone and say here, or you can type in the chat room and say, and you know, type here in the chat room when I call your name. And I'm going to go with um, with first name and last name. So I'm probably going to mess up pronunciations on quite a few of your names. I apologize in advance. Eventually, I'll switch to first names and maybe just an initial of your last name. And then I'll, I'll learn how to pronounce the names a little better and more correct. All right, let's give it a try. Grigor Abadjan. Grigor Abajan. So make sure you guys unmute yourselves if you're here. No, no Grigor. Kenya Aguilar Cisneros. Kenya is here. Amr Almaya. Here. Thank you. Amanda Amari. Thank you. Elizabeth Babayan. Elizabeth Babayan, no Elizabeth. Victor Corral Barbosa, thank you. Artak Bozayan, thank you. Alexander Boychenka, here. Thank you. Nicholas Churchan. Nicholas Churchian, no Nicholas. Olivia Ferenc, thank you. Givork Galajan, thank you. Givork Galiban, thank you. 
Aranza Gonzalez. Thank you. Joseph Gonzalez. Thank you. Lindsay Gonzalez. Thank you. Annie Gregorian. Thank you. Chloe Holland. Thank you. Oscar Hernandez. Oscar Hernandez. No Oscar. Evelyn Herrera. Evelyn Herrera. No Evelyn. M.D. Hossein. Professor, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Evelyn is here. I'm here. Evelyn Herrera? Yes. Okay, so today I'll mark you here, but but for the future, I, you have to respond when I call your name. M.D. Okay. Hossein, you're saying you're here, M.D.? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Vardex Hofsepan. Thank you. And if you guys just kind of randomly respond here, that tells me that you weren't here and you have no idea what's going on to Adriana. Tyler Ivazian. Tyler Ivazian. No Tyler. Bagrat Hachatran. Here. Thank you. Elizeth Lopez. Here. Thank you. Jennifer Lopez. Here. Thank you. Gurgen Malikistan. Here. Thank you. Probably messed up your last name. I apologize. Jose Mendez. Jose Mendez. No Jose. Julia Morales Castillo. Julia is here. Thank you. Oscar Moscoso. Oscar. Oscar is here. Thank you. Adam Nguyen. Uh, here. It's actually pronounced Wint. Thank you. Wint? Uh, Win. It's uh, Vietnamese. Oh, the last name, Win. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I had no idea. I'll try to remember. Win. <laughs> Thank you. Anna Papayan. Thank you. Anna Rama Ramazan. Thank you. Maria Ramirez. Thank you. Alan Rios. Here. Thank you. Ross Eric Rosas. Thank you. America Senek. Thank you. Susie Saravia. Here. Thank you. Suzanne Sarkisian. So, yeah, okay, you're here. Thank you. Michael Stambulian. Thank you. Nagera Tadesi. Tadesi. I'm here. Thank Present. you. Natalie Vale. Present. Thank you. Darlene Vieda. Here. Thank you. Adriana Zambre. Here. Thank, Here. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, Ellen Zatikian. Thank you. And Mateo Zelaya. Here. 